Hi, everybody who's joining us now. I see we have got some folks here, but we're waiting on a few more. So we'll just start just a couple of minutes late to give people an opportunity to get into the Zoom. Hey folks, if you're just joining us, we're just going to give a couple minutes here for, for people to be able to join the Zoom and then we will get started. Thank you all. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for joining us again. Uh, my name is Dan Griffiths. I'm uh, head of business operations here at Hippo Education. And I will be joined today by Paul John, who is VP of uh, Education here at Hippo and Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at UCSF. Uh, he will be the smart one and I will be the other guy. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're here uh, today to talk about uh, urgent care education here at Hippo. Um, we're going to go through um, some prepared uh, information, but we do have a Q&A uh, tab here at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your little cursor over it, you'll be able to see it. So please put your questions there. We will stop regularly for questions and we'll try to get through everybody's questions as best we can. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for having us. And uh, over the next several minutes, I wanted to just give a little high level view of where we're going and what we want to accomplish uh, during the session. And I wanted to start from a really big picture perspective of before getting into the product demos, getting into the why of why we even created these products, which is the educational philosophy and how we want to reframe learning for urgent care. And then the how of how we actually go about executing that through educational design and really focusing in on the clinician's educational needs. And then finally, after we get through that context, I think it'll set the stage for us to actually go into the product demos and the specific products that we're talking about, which kind of fall into two large buckets that we're gonna talk about onboarding needs, which are distinctly different from ongoing related educational needs. So that's the roadmap for what we're gonna do today. And so just briefly, I wanna start off with educational philosophy and, and why we are where we are at today. Um, and a large part of it comes back to personal related things about how I almost quit medicine. And a large uh, part of that is this, you can see these two axes between confidence and ability, where if you break it up into different quadrants, there are those of us in clinical practice who are very confident in what we do. And if you're like me with imposter syndrome, we struggle with that level of confidence. And then there's also the other axis, which is about ability and competence, if you will, not confidence, but competence. And you can either be in that low ability or high ability state. And really, when you break it up into those kind of quadrants, anywhere other than that high confidence, high ability state is what kind of predisposes you to burnout, which is where I was at, because I, no matter what level of ability, if you have low confidence, when that meets the urgent care situation of high demand and high volume, it certainly just leads you to a place where things are not clicking, you're not in a flow state. And so where we start off with, why we even create these products is because we were focused singularly on how do you get learners and clinicians to get to that one quadrant, that sweet spot, where you have high confidence, high ability. Where can that be and how do we get there? So how do we get there is where it comes into the design aspect of things, where what we did was doing just a really meticulous um, uh, focus groups 
with different stakeholders, the, the actual clinicians who are on the front lines and what it is that they want to learn, they wish they had learned. And so those who are about to start, there are things that we're anxious about before we actually embark in a career in urgent care. And then those, when we look back, wish we knew um, had we when, when we started. And then a unique perspective from like a top-down, if you will, a, a, an overview from medical director's perspective, where you take a look at a cohort and say, well, these are the things I wish that they all knew. You don't know what you don't know. And so it's that extra perspective. And what was really fascinating when we were doing these um, uh, focus groups is that there are very common themes that come up and I'm sure it resonates with all of us in clinical medicine, which is about time, access, and direction. I don't have time for any of this education. I don't know how to get this kind of information. And even if you did give it to me, where do I even start? Because the amount of knowledge is just so overwhelming and can be intimidating. And so it led to these themes of how do we make things, the education concise? How do we curate them and customize them for the individual learner's needs? So that's the how of the framework that leads into the conversation today, which is about what are the products that ended up coming from all of this um, deliberation and planning and design. So there are two buckets that we're going to cover. One is onboarding where there are a lot of condensed time frame and a high steep learning curve. And then there are products that we have educationally for ongoing where there is never ending learning. How do you actually stay up to date um, in that context of I don't have time um, where do I find this information? And even with that information, how am I supposed to figure out what I should be doing now? So we're going to start off in the first half with onboarding products, and then we'll take a break to ask questions. And then the second half is going to be about the ongoing products, education products, and then ask questions then again. So the first product, there are two products we're going to talk about, which is Urgent Care Bootcamp, which is a video course. And then there is a correlated Urgent Care Bootcamp assessment, which is a multiple choice question assessment set of questions that we're going to talk about in this first half. And to kick us off with the video course, I wanted to hand it off to Dan uh, just to give a quick live demonstration. OK, thank you. I'm going to share my screen with you so I can show you this. OK, so now you're looking at the Urgent Care Boot Camp. Um, and you know, at HIPAA, we, we take um, couple of components and put them together in, in a way that I think works uh, really well, which is high production value. We try to make these courses look beautiful. Uh, we, we work very hard on production as well as, of course, the clinical content. And then simple technology, simple design that makes these courses really easy to use. So when you look at this course, it's broken up into three basic buckets. Um, you'll see a, a sort of practice of urgent care overview help us really define what we're talking about when we talk about urgent care. And then we'll see this, this large section of clinical approach videos. So these are really gonna be clinical decision-making, patient presentations, and um, common situations that you're gonna be seeing there. We're breaking them down by organ systems. And when you go into any organ system, very simply, you're gonna open up uh, a menu of lectures, Important to note that we do not um, sort of put up 45 minute, 60 minute lectures of one person with a slide set kind of talking at you. We have multiple uh, uh, clinicians talking together, really synthesizing your experience of the education so that um, we have someone who can ask the kinds of questions we imagine you might ask if you were uh, getting through this point in the education and, and needing some follow up. Um, and all of our videos are set up like that. And then the next bucket will be these, um, these uh, procedural fundamentals. So in all of these topics here, we're gonna go deep into uh, procedures, which we know are the bread and butter of urgent care um, and really show you what it looks like to get into this. Um, you'll see as these open up, um, again, we're covering a wide range of topics. Really, the idea here is that this is a comprehensive course that, that shows you um, soup to nuts, everything you're going to see in the urgent care. Paul, I will stop sharing and give it back to you. So uh, just going along with what Dan had said, the the prime focus for us is about user first. And it is at that intersection of um, quality. And a lot of that is incorporating multimedia principles of learning and learning theory, if you will. And that's what I geek out on. 
and curricular design and delivery of education. And the way we designed the urgent care boot camp as what he had alluded to earlier are three buckets because there is a practice of urgent care medicine. Those are the um, non-technical soft skills, if you will, uh, and things that aren't um, uh, textbook based, if you will, but require honest conversation about how one actually, let's say, calls a consult or how one presents a case or how one clinically reasons through difficult cases. Uh, and then there's a clinical approach, which is a lot more of the bread and butter content of what's really practical, practical application of how you actually diagnose and manage uh, specific cases, whether they're in the bucket, as you saw, about the most common infections or the most common types of chief complaints that you'll see, as well as more disease-based traditional organ systems. So dermatology, ENT, the common conditions that you will see, especially you need to know as you're onboarding in urgent care. And then perhaps the most important one are the procedural fundamentals, because there's no amount of experience that will expose you early in your career to all of the different procedures that you will be asked to do. And every situation and setting is going to be different about what kind of procedures you can be doing and or uh, will be doing. And so these are why we have hundreds of videos and uh, high quality production in order to relieve that cognitive burden so you can actually see one before you do one. And when we talk about um, the actual products themselves, I thought in giving the examples of what we do, it might actually be better to show you from the perspective of the actual users of our product and the testimonials that they give us to frame why it's so useful. When we can talk a lot about, oh yeah, this is really practical, or oh yeah, this is really good or engaging, but what does it actually mean in practice? And these are from our annual surveys that just came back about uh, several weeks ago. And these are, are, these are not my words, these are from our active users. And so, as you know, in urgent care, dermatology is one of those common areas that everyone, myself included, even 10 plus years out, um, I still feel uncomfortable with. And so how do you actually get more comfortable, especially when you're starting? Um, this is where this person says, I use the derm references on rashes, steroid concentration, and treatment recommendations almost every shift. I have been able to accurately diagnose and treat patient problems. And and I wanted to, each of these clips I'm going to show you, we're going to go over three different examples. They're only about a minute long, and, and I just want you to take a close listen about all the things that are really hard to capture in the words. The last thing to think about with the formulation is that uh, things that are more alcohol-based, so when we're looking at solutions or gels, those are going to sting on skin that is broken down. So if someone no. has a very inflamed area of their skin, they have fissures or little cracks in their skin, it really burns to put on anything that's not an ointment. I always start with ointment, even if just for a few days to heal the skin and then switch them to switch them to something that they're going to tolerate for a longer uh, period yeah. of time. The classic example of that is like diaper dermatitis, super uh, sensitive. You put right. on a cream even sometimes for those kids and it hurts. They'll yeah, cry immediately. They cry like so crazy. Trying to keep it really it's nice and pearl. soothing. Yep. Nice. So that is an example. Uh, this is um, Dr. DeClerc, who is a dermatologist, who is going through topical steroids as a talk. And as many of those of us in practice know, the classes of, of, of uh, steroid, corticosteroids that you can use is endless. I mean, dozens upon dozens. What do you choose? And then not only are they the types and potency, but also the vehicles of delivery, ointments, creams, solutions. Like, where do you start? How do you make sense of all of that? It's simplifying it to keep it very practical. And so from that perspective, this is where that conversation came up. And this is the kind of back and forth conversation about actually more in a conversation you feel like you're listening in on and being able to glean the, 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 the insight and the tricks of the trade um, that you can apply because, oh, I didn't realize from that framing. There are just so many of those epiphany type moments in this kind of casual conversation setting that makes learning a lot less intimidating and a lot more engaging because these are honest cases with great practical application. And here's another example where a user was saying, it has given me confidence to do procedures and manage urgent health visits where I would previously have sent patients to another clinic. In my multi-practitioner clinic, I am now the go-to person for toenail removal. And so this is where I'll show an example of, uh, this is a procedure video where the person who's actually performing this procedure is a podiatrist and actually going step-by-step -step through how you actually do a toenail removal, and I recognize that this could be potentially very disturbing to look at. So 
I'm only going to play a few seconds of this clip, but understand that when you actually have a specialist going through with high quality video production, close up angles, different angle shots um, with high resolution, that is what we're looking for to actually communicate. Well, this is how you do it and the nuances and the movement. So the first step is you're going to be doing a partial removal. So you have to. And I'll start stop right there. <laughs> so I think you can use the rest of your imagination. For those of you who've actually done toenail removals, like these are things where, where do you actually see one before you do one? I mean, you can look at static images or try to find it on different video platforms, but this is where the hundreds of videos actually are helpful to actually go through and learn the appropriate techniques and indications uh, from the experts themselves. Here's the last one for the urgent care bootcamp video course, which is if I had a resident who missed part of the I had a resident who missed part of the cardiology rotation, had them do the EKG section, is remarkably transformative. So much so, months later, um, they were asking some cardiac question on rounds, got the answer right, reference urgent care bootcamp for why I knew it. Uh, this is where, uh, again, where there are things that, especially when it comes to ECGs, like this is something that even, again, 10 plus years, I still have. Uh, moments of epiphany when I'm reviewing or learning new things. Where do you learn the basics? And we have the basics, so we have a set of basics, but then how do you do a little bit more on top of that? Um, so you can understand and getting the uh, world's preeminent uh, cardi emergency cardiology EKG teacher, um, on the two who, for those of you who know, let's listen in on a clip of those kinds of pearls that they're dropping left and right. We're gonna start out by talking about the hyperacute T wave. I think most everybody's gone through the basics knows that hyperacute T waves tend to predict an early STEMI. So this is a nice little diagram of what hyperacute Ts develop. So on the left, this ECG portion shows normal looking T waves and then the ischemia begins and you'll notice that the T waves become more broad and taller. Those are typically what's referred to as hyperacute T waves. And then this person went on to infarct and had some ST elevation with T wave inversions and biphasic T waves. Well, what we, though we've all learned that hyperacute T waves are broad and tall, I want to change your mindset a little bit about what hyperacute T waves are. For example, in this case, I want to focus your attention not on how broad and tall those T waves are, but look how straight the initial part of the T wave is. To me, that's what a hyperacute T wave is. Hyperacute, in other words, early ischemic T waves become very straight at the beginning portion of the T wave. And that was a minute. And like, that was just a wealth of knowledge where you get more of that, where it's just a little bit more, what's that extra nugget, the bells and whistles around, just poor knowledge that you could probably find in a textbook. But once actually a veteran explains it to you, that's where that's where the where the value is at. And so that's the urgent care bootcamp. Um, moving on to the urgent care bootcamp assessment. This is a, a hundred item multiple choice assessment that actually is closely tied and designed intentionally with the urgent care bootcamp video course in mind because they are tied one to one with the topic areas of the things that those who are going to be uh, they're onboarding in urgent care practice should really know uh, to demonstrate a, a baseline level of standardized competence that we've actually done uh, uh, studies on to actually look and objectively evaluate uh, how these assessments perform with uh, learners in case studies. And so I want to pass it off to Dan at this point to give a live demonstration. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for stopping the toenail video much sooner than you stopped it yesterday when you showed it to me. I very much appreciate it. I was just going to, before to wrap up the boot camp assessment, I just wanted to um, point out that if you look up here, um, I am here on a set. So it looks like a lovely office, but in fact, we're on the set of our, our uh, boot camp that we're filming now. Um, and that just sort of goes to show you, we're, we'll do this in a studio setting. Paul and I are in the same building. He's in an audio booth, I think. Um, anyways, that's kind of fun. So we show you the lights in the ceiling, like you've never seen lights before. It's fun. Um, all right, so let me show you the urgent care boot camp assessment. One second here, share my screen. Two years of Zoom and we still haven't learned how to do it. Okay, now you can see the, uh, here at the top of my screen, you can see the clinical readiness assessment. That's the full and fancy name. Um, we will click on it. So these are gonna be questions that in every case are clinical vignettes. You see here, we're gonna show a clinical presentation. 
47 year old woman comes to the urgent care clinic because she's had dizziness for the past two days. She's also been easily fatigued over the past few weeks. The patient has not had ear pain, headache, chest pain, change in appetite or vomiting. Medical history includes uterine fibroids and osteoarthritis and current medications include daily ibuprofen. Uh, pulse rate is 98. Uh, respirations are 48 a minute and blood pressure is 101 over 58. Uh, saturation on room air is 100%. Physical exam shows nail, uh, pale nail beds, and one six systolic ejection murmur. Which of the following tests is most likely to determine the diagnosis? Uh, I'll be honest, I have no idea, but the fun part here is that we can make a choice, um, submit our choice, and then we'll get clear explanations of both the distractor, the distractor choices as well as the correct answer. These are gonna be detailed. In every case, as I said, they're clinical vignettes. Um, and as you go through this, you have a chance to really look at how you're doing um, and evaluate uh, for yourself how you're doing, but also if you're an employer or a manager, how your team is doing. We have a suite of, of tools here, which I'll also show you, um, which will allow you to manage uh, your team. So you look here, this is my team. Uh, we are salespeople, obviously not very good at medicine, doing our best. Um, but you can see you've got your scores here. And if I open this up, um, we can see with detail in each organ system how we're doing. And we can go in and look at specific questions, what's right and what's wrong, um, and use that as a way to uh, either funnel folks back into the education or know that they're ready for, for um, practice. Uh, I have clients who use this as a pretest where they've given it to 200, 250 of their clinical providers. And, um, and that's how they decide who needs more education, who maybe needs to spend time in some part of the urgent care boot camp, or maybe all of it. Um, and then I have others who use it as a test that they give before uh, folks are, are uh, taking a first shift. Um, and you can really use these tools however it works for your organization. And that's the beauty of them is their flexibility. Um, okay, Paul, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, I wanted to actually highlight too, uh, I geek out on this, so excuse me, just because it gets me really excited. But when we actually design the questions, it's not as if it's an arbitrary, oh, let's just, you know, create a question and just create a question, how or which way the style is going to be. Um, we actually have trained item writers and myself um, included with regard to the National Board of Medical Examiners style of question writing. We actually have a senior technical editor who actually oversees them after rigorous content peer review process then technical editing, then a final peer review process content wise, and then they get validated um, uh, in, in, uh, in practice, if you will. And so those questions um, have gone through a rigorous process to actually get to where it is. So it's standardized. And so how we even design the questions are really technical and the answer choices themselves, um, the, the quality that you would expect to make sure that it's not like easily guessable, if you will, um, or it's too much of a gotcha type of questions. These are really practical things that uh, we've designed in a standardized way. And so the beauty of that, if you saw, and I don't know if, um, if you noticed, but they were tagged, um, the questions were tagged and they show you how the performance is. And so this is what we're talking about. It's not just about curated content where we figured out through focus groups and stakeholders, key stakeholders, how the, co what content we should cover, but of that content, I, I, where do you even start? And this is that blueprint, if you will, because everyone's different. I might be good at orthopedics, but I really am not good at rheumatology, let's say, as a specific subset. And this is where you find out where every learner is because everyone comes from different walks of life and different levels of practice. And how do you level set that? And this is where you actually can use that tool very effectively to actually identify strengths and areas of development. And that's how you can point them to the video courses. That's where you start instead of just starting from chapter one to chapter 100. And so that's the beauty of that custom level within the curation. I just want to point that out because I do keep that. So um, there's a lot of intentionality to it is, is, the, is what I'm trying to say. So from that perspective, um, we also went over the, the dashboard. Um, so I wanted to just take a little pause right here uh, for questions if there are any questions. Yes, let me look, Paul, this uh, Q&A tab. I don't see any currently. We can certainly take a second, though, and give people a chance. We can hold for questions. Oh, I got a question. How is the video course used throughout a company? That's a great question. So the, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the flexibility of these programs. So, you know, they can be implemented any way you choose to. Um, we have, we have, uh, companies who use the boot camp 
um, for every new hire and established clinicians aren't really seeing it, um, but every new hire is going through it. It's about 47 and a half hours of content currently. Um, we'll add to that, um, you know, somewhere in the range of five to 10 hours of new content per year. Um, so um, that's a major commitment. Um, but so they'll, they'll have new hires do it either as part of their training or in advance of their training before they take their first shift. We have other folks who have run it throughout their entire organization and just said, hey, you've got a year, take your time, go through this. Um, you can use it as a touchstone so that you can come back to it um, you know, as you need to at the end of a shift where you feel really challenged. Um, you see something that you really didn't understand and you need to come back to some, some didactic learning. Um, we have organizations that just make it available for that as well. All right, Paul, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, not really. I was just gonna actually read the uh, Q and the second one, which is, can you reset the assessment and retake? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, yes, you can. Um, you know, look, the, the idea behind these tests, this assessment specifically, the reason we call it clinical readiness assessment is it is a guide for both the clinician and the clinical manager to really understand whether the, the learner is ready to, to practice. And, and that's really just about providing the best care you can provide to your patients. So it's not intended to, um, to be a roadblock to anything. It's really supposed to facilitate um, better understanding, a better sense of, of where each individual is in their, in their readiness. And, um, and so we make it as flexible and as easy to use for the individual as we can. Yeah, there's no substitute for, I mean, actual clinical practice and, th and, and through chart reviews and, and all that. However, at the same time, the question I think that everyone is always wondering is when you hire or when you actually start in practice and, and where do you provide that guidance? And it's so interesting when we work with different groups. And this is what I talk about through validation of that question set. You, we've seen in the past with different groups that there are outliers. And with those outliers, what it does is it gives you a heads up as to like what additional support or assistance do they need in order to get them to the place that you want them to practice, as opposed to, oh, I don't know exactly how to help them. It's again, that custom level of curation because the reality of urgent care is that you just get whatever walks in through the door, right? But how do you assess holistically the, the fund of knowledge and the breadth of knowledge and the depth of knowledge that a person has if, if you're at the mercy of whatever walks through the door, because you do want to have some level set that everyone has a certain level of uh, confidence and competence with regard to those areas. And so just want to highlight uh, that uh, the assessment has been used in really unique and creative ways in order to be able to assist and, and, and improve the overall um, competence and confidence of their clinicians. And I, I flashed up another, uh, it was before with regard to the, right before the dashboard about the assessment, about how there, we also have case studies, if you're interested, of how, we, how people have used the urgent care boot camp video course as well as the assessment combined to lead to a 95% retention rate because burnout is real. I, I've certainly felt it. I have certainly experienced it. And I know that especially this time and now it's at the forefront of a lot of people in medicine's mind. And so I want to make sure that we can support our clinicians the best that we can with education. So that's no longer a barrier, but it's actually a facilitator for people who feel like they can hit their sweet spot, that peak flow state. So just want to add that a little bit. All right. That's, uh, that's our questions for now. We'll, okay. we, we have opportunities at, at regular intervals here, um, you know, so feel free to add questions as we go and we'll answer them as we can. Sounds good. So the next set of uh, products are, are about the ongoing, and this is such a wonderful area because this is how do you stay sharp and how do you make sure you're at the tip of the spear um, because the amount of information certainly with onboarding there's a lot it's a steep learning curve in a condensed time period with ongoing it's just a, vol a fire hydrant of information how do you process it how do you surface what's relevant what do I need to know how is it supposed to apply to my practice because with onboarding it's a lot more foundational knowledge that everyone can agree on ongoing as we also know in this current environment, like there's evolution in, in guidelines and in practice. How do you stay up to date? How do you figure that out? Because it is very, very challenging. And so the two products we're going to talk about are Urgent Care Reviews and Perspectives, which is a, our audio podcast, and then the Urgent Care Lifelong Learning and Self-Assessment, which is that similar kind of multiple choice item uh, uh, set of questions 
but it's designed in such a unique way. And so I'm really excited. I, if you can't tell, I'm really, I, I'm very passionate about this kind of stuff. So uh, I will start off with the audio podcast first, um, which is uh, a monthly uh, a podcast that is comprised of anywhere about like 13 to 15 chapters. And each of them uh, and combined, I should say, are about like three and a half hours every month. Um, and they're separated out into very unique channels. And so there are channels like, what would I do next? Um, those are clinical reasoning areas or excellence in physical exam, which is how do you actually perform a physical exam uh, procedure correctly or technique correctly and how do you interpret it and understand the, the different sensitivity and specificity with that. Or paper chase, which is about the top articles that you need to know and how it gets critically appraised and how you should apply it in practice um, there's so much to talk about, but you know what? I'll let Dan actually give you that live demonstration. Okay. That's exactly what I will do. So I'm going to um, share with you a look at the, the web app. Of course, there is a mobile version of this. Um, and I think, you know, this, this uh, podcast is three hours per month of new content, three hours a month of CME. Um, and um, so the mobile app, I think, is how most people find it easy to consume. It's, it's great if you've got a commute. Uh, it's fantastic if you're um, walking the dog, working out. Um, and for a lot of people, it's fantastic if you're just sitting quietly, um, you know, um, not having to do any of those things. Um, I'm going to, excuse me while I open up this here. So here you can see this is our, our latest episode, November. Um, and as we scroll down on the side here, you can see all the, the kinds of um, chapters that we've got here. So as Paul said, it's 13 to 15 chapters per month. Um, these are gonna be topics that are about what's happening in your urgent care, in all urgent cares right now. Um, this is not intended to be sort of deep dive academia. This is, this is about clinical practice um, and clinical decision-making and clinical thinking. Um, and we present them in a way that's really entertaining. If you think about your favorite podcast, what This American Life or Serial or, or any of the podcasts that you listen to simply to be entertained, that's what we try to build into all of our podcasts with clinical topics. So um, you'll see here on the left, you've got some, some pearls. There's an opportunity to join in a discussion here. Um, but at the end of the day, this is really about great content in bite-sized pieces. You can listen when you have time where you have time, you're earning CME, CME accrues as you listen. There's nothing else you have to do. It's added to your account just for listening. Um, and, um, and most importantly, we find that people uh, love this. It becomes a really important part of their month, um, finding a little bit of time uh, to reinforce their learning, but also to be entertained and engaged. And Paul, I'll pass it to you as soon as I stop sharing. There you go. All right. So again, similar to like what we did in the first half, I, instead of just talking through more about the actual product itself, I thought I would see it from the lens of the actual users from our annual surveys. And these are the actual feedback that we get uh, from, uh, from listeners uh, for this particular podcast. And the authors are friendly, funny, lively, bring a smile to my face, even though after five or six 12 hour shifts in a row, um, I'm over medicine for a minute, and, and that's the reality that we have, and that's why there's an intentional design to actually how we design the podcast. Um, I Just to reveal a little bit under the hood, we actually have quite an extensive production team as well as a content team that work together in, in this kind of uh, conducted orchestra, if you will. There's quite a lot that goes into how we actually storyboard the pieces, how we actually conduct the interviews how we do pitch sessions. So we're actually trying to figure out like how if we have a topic and we brainstorm topics, what are the things that people want to know? How do we actually cut it down and actually use sound to our advantage, if you will. And so that's where a lot of the creative aspects that we can apply again, learning theory and practice of using actual intentional pauses or sound effects, audio cues, um, and different ways of actually delivering uh, information in order to keep you engaged to bring that smile on your face, especially after you had a rough day. So, and uh, let's take a listen. Mies, every time I have diarrhea, two things run through my head. Let me guess, first of all, it's a good thing you're like my brother because these conversations are hysterical. 
I'll bet you wondered if it was the bad fish tacos you had last night. Yeah. The first thing is, I'm like, am I traveling? Is this traveler's <laughs> diarrhea? Where's my diarrhea care pack that I bring with me? Uh huh. Or, well, that was going to be, you're the wilderness guy, you're the travel guy. So, yeah. Yes. Was it something I drank or ate in the wrong place? The other thing is, have I been on antibiotics recently, aka the ones I just took for my traveler's diarrhea? And now, do I have C. diff? Because I am paranoid. <laughs> I'm seeing patients with C. diff on my shifts, in the ER, in the urgent care. And now I have it because I'm just, I'm that dude that got it and I'm stuck forever. <laughs> Well, thankfully, here to help us talk about C. diff is Dr. Cameron Berg. I don't know that he wants to be part of oh, the show I do. Now. Welcome, Cam. Absolutely. Cameron. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is where it's like the whole idea is of you, like if you think about your favorite radio shows, uh, we actually have uh, our senior audio producer is from the radio world, the best practices that you have in industry and what are those lessons that you learn to apply it because it's those little things that when you have an actual conversation, you feel like you could just have a cup of coffee with any of these people because they're real. <laughs> the personalities are just so relatable and also their experiences are also relatable. But what we're doing is being able to give insight into how people, this one is a part of the what would I do next, like a series, if you will, and, and a topic review of like, what do you, how do you clinically reason through this and how do you actually manage that? And so that's kind of like the, the, uh, idea instead of being talked at in a straight lecture similar to the urgent care boot camp videos the, our podcast our audio podcast is meant to be i'll say our our, our end point the goal that we're trying to reach is when you drive up in your driveway will you be sticking around inside your car to wait for it to finish like you do with any other radio show that you really love because you don't you just want to finish it before you get into the house like we know that that's the way um, to, to, to keep you engaged so that when you're engaged, you actually will learn something. I, I drive around the block, Paul, because uh, if I pull into my driveway, people will find me. <laughs> so let's take another look at, uh, we'll have three of them. So another one right here is plenty of use. These are staff with solo providers. And because of that, I'm unable to gain ideas and practice guidelines from other providers. This podcast helps guide my medical standard of care for the specialty of urgent care. And what a wonderful truth that we're a lot of lone wolves, right, um, in the practices that we're in. And the idea of how do you actually sharpen, how do you get sharpened? If, if iron sharpens iron, where's the other part of that that sharpens you? Where do you actually soundboard and, and gain new ideas? Where do you have those conversations? Because I don't know about you, for those of you who clinically work, but when I come home, I don't really want to keep on talking about work. I, I just want to be at home. And so how do you actually get that level of back and forth to get um, new perspectives? and also stay up to date and understand how other people are interpreting the same thing that you might be reading, but just want a different perspective. So I just wanted to give you a sample of, um, this is that channel, what do I do next? Um, as it relates to sound science, we'll take a listen. This month's What Would I Do Next is personal. I have horrible sinuses this time of year, all times of year. My sinuses are always killing me. And I'm a doctor. I take care of patients with sinusitis. But when it's me, when I have a pounding headache, when my nose is running, when I just feel like my head is going to explode, I don't know what to do. I don't know scientifically what the next best step is. Do I need antibiotics? Should I go to the store and look at the thousands of different products that are available to treat sinusitis? So to help me and subsequently to help my patients, I have brought Doug Wallace back on the show. Doug, thank you for this personal medical advice you're going to give me. So walk me through this. My sinuses are killing me. What do I do next? Well, Matt, first off, I'm here for you. But when it comes down to it, the first question you're going to ask when you're thinking about sinusitis is, is this bacterial or is it viral? To be viral or to be bacterial, that is the question. So it's just uh, another way of using audio cues, but also walking you down pathways, just really practical application of the guidelines and going through the guidelines and understanding how that actually applies. Um, here's the last one. I actually caught an MI that I might not have caught if I hadn't listened to the podcast on heartburn and, and MI. It has made me a more well-rounded practitioner. 
And I think that speaks to like the ultimate question, which is that whatever I'm listening to and learning, does it actually make a difference? Does it actually change my practice? And not only that, does it actually impact patient outcomes? And that's like the million dollar question. I think everyone in education wants the answer through research, but it's always hard to quantify. But anecdotally, what I can tell you is, is that this is not words that I created. This is just something from a user because the reality is everyone is different in their experiences and what they know, and what they don't know um, at that Johari's window, if you will. Um, and this is a piece uh, about the medical legal risks of lower chest pain. We'll take a listen. So what do you think is the most common misdiagnosis sitting on the chart of a malpractice case for a missed MI? Take a guess. It's not gastroenteritis. That's the wrong <laughs> organ, another high risk <laughs> diagnosis, wrong <laughs> organ system, but. Uh, reflux, yeah. That's exactly reflux. right. You were in the right organ system, yeah. actually. Reflux is exactly right. Reflux is the most common misdiagnosis sitting on a malpractice case. And it's very common for patients with acute coronary syndrome to present with reflux type of symptoms. So it's just those kinds of perspectives, if you will, from experts um, to understand, like, how do you actually uh, approach and risk mitigate and also lead to better patient outcomes? Just knowing the atypical presentations, if you will, and just being aware of it, not necessarily um, uh, actively going on doing uh, defensive medicine, if you will. That's a phrase that we uh, hear about a lot, but also just being aware of the situations that you should be on the lookout for those red flags, um, because those are where common mistakes are made. So you can actually avoid them by actually being equipped with that knowledge. And so um, that I think hopefully those three things give you a flavor of what the podcast is like. And, and uh, it, this is just a, uh, one of those things where we just try to bring together with the next part, which is the urgent care, lifelong learning and self-assessment. Because the reality is, so this is a, a multiple choice item set of questions that we'll, we'll talk about briefly. But as we go into that demo, what I want to share with you is just that it is just five questions a month. And we've recognized that whole issue back again, time, access, and direction. I don't have time. And this is one of the big things and themes that came up with our, our stakeholder groups about even with podcasts. Um, you know, we, even though we designed it to be the paper chases, the critical appraisals are only five minutes long, right? No one wants to listen to too much stats. We just want to know how to apply it. And we want, if you want to learn more, we give you more information, but the vast majority of the pieces of chapters are about 15 to 20 minutes long, which is just enough for at least an average drive or like, you know, a time in the gym, just so you can take in a bite-sized chunk. Um, However, even then, some people say that's too long. How do you even get that kind of information? What are the most critical things that are most practical and practice changing that I should know about? And this is where the beauty of that intentional design comes into play. So I'll hand it over to Dan. All right, I'm gonna show you the Urgent Care LLSA. Um, so this is very simply, as Paul said, five clinical questions per month uh, they look very much like the questions we've shown you in the in the assessment. I'll, I'll show you. These are questions that have been peer reviewed. Um, we're linking them to uh, to um, an, an article. I mean, these these are also coming out of our podcast. Um, so let's look at this one. This is one from I think November. A uh, 64 year old man with a history of osteoarthritis comes to the urgent care because he has had worsening pain in the right knee for the past six months. Uh, physical examination shows tenderness in the right calf and limited extension of the right knee. Ultrasonography of the lower right extremity shows a pope. You can say that, Paul. Uh, cyst, according to Herman et al., which of the following is the next best step? Paul, do you know? Yeah, I do, but I actually want to watch you answer this. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to go for, uh, let's go for cystic aspiration, Paul. Let's see what happens here. Okay, I'm gonna click here to submit my answer. Oh, I'm go. so good. So I, I good. do wanna point out here, um, it, it's so interesting because as you go through these questions, um, these, are, these are deliberately intentionally tied to the Urgent Care podcast because they provide a deeper discussion into this topic about Baker's cysts and bursitis. And, and what we do is we take, because we recognize the importance of practicing evidence-based medicine, um, that's why all of these questions are tied to references and based off of either original research, guidelines, topic reviews that are PubMed indexed. So they're in journals that are PubMed indexed. 
And so you can actually, if you want to, refer back to the actual source reference. If you want that level of detail, you can get that discussion on that topic as it relates to this uh, area in that chapter that you can link to. And in the answer, though, if you don't want to do any of that, at least in the answer explanation itself, what it provides is context as to why this is relevant in the urgent care, as well as a brief synopsis of the actual article or publication itself. And this was a review article where it actually is helpful to understand for patient care, for patient care continuity, like what is the ultimate like um, uh, treatment management that is most useful for this? Because it may come up, maybe you might not necessarily do anything about it in the moment right now, but at the same time for patient education, that's also going to be important. But we do focus these questions out of all the like 13, 14, 15 chapters per month, and we select the most important practical things that you can actually take home today. And so if you go through the rest of the questions, there are other ones where we talk about the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines um, on, I think it was urinary tract infections. There are other ones that talk about research articles. Um, we talk about the monthly paper chases. Every month there's about the top five papers that you should be aware of, and so we'll select one of those. And we go through all those things where you can literally spend one minute or I should say five minutes, one minute per question. And in five minutes, you just, you can already figure out what are gonna be practical, practice changing things. If that's all you have, that's all you care to do. Even if it's not even all five of them, it's just one of them. In one minute, you can pick it up. And if you want more information, you have multiple modalities to actually explore that based on what your level of need and or desire. Absolutely. Uh, worth mentioning that just like the other programs we showed you, the uh, same, dashboard here is going to give you some insight into your team's performance on the urgent care LSA. So for a lot of a lot of the companies we work with, this is something they ask everybody to do every month. It's five to 10 minutes per month. Um, for some of them, maybe they have an urgent care wrap subscription, so they'll go a little deeper or they'll read the article. But for many, that's really what they'll do. And it's a way for the employer to say, hey, we care about continuing to learn. Uh, we care about clinical education. We care about putting this um, effort in for our patients. And for others, it's really just about that stratification and feeling supported. There's a patient facing piece to this if you choose to use it, which is a, a door sticker or something for the front desk of your urgent care, where you can say to patients, hey, we, we do this program, we're lifelong learners. Um, but however you choose to use it, uh, it's, it's a minimal input to get a pretty maximum output. And I will stop sharing and pass it back to you, Paul. Yeah. And it's just overall wonderful because um, oh, there we go. It's uh, it's wonderful because the LSA is similarly tagged in, in the sense of the urgent care boot camp video assessment, where what you get is you actually over time, um, because it's only five questions a month, it's hard to actually figure out information just from those five questions about where areas of strength and areas of development are. But guess what? Over a year or a couple of years, you actually get a really interesting scope from a personal like analytic dashboard perspective of like where the areas of strength and weaknesses or development areas of development are um, because over time there's a, a diverse representation of different kinds of questions and topic areas where you can find out oh yeah you know what I'm pretty strong in this versus like this area I could probably use a little bit more help and so that is again that custom curation customized curation what I like to call precision education where you find out more information and insight about yourself through data so that's where we talk about, at least at HIPPO, the intersection of personality, where our, our, the people that we have, the quality that we bring, and then the technology that's user first about how do you actually leverage all three of those. And we're at that intersection. That's what we're striving for. So that's where I want to leave it at. From a questions perspective, that is that last one. So the, the last thing I'll say about the Urgent Care LSA um, is we are, are really invested and folks trying this. And so we have a lot of organizations that we've said, hey, if you'd like to use this for your organization, we will not charge you for that. So um, you're gonna get an email from, from us for signing up for this course. You're gonna be uh, receiving three months free of the Urgent Care Wrap podcast. Um, and with that, you'll be able to, there'll be an email address for me there and you'll be able to send me a note. And if you'd like to try this for free uh, for a year, um, we're happy to facilitate that. We'd, we'd love to make that happen for you. All right, Paul, I have some questions here. Are we ready for questions? Let's do it. All right, I have a couple that I can answer and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one over to you. Um, sure. With a subscription, can you access all historical content? 
So yes, the answer is yes, you, you can see the entire archive of episodes and access all of them. You get CME for, for the portion of episodes um, in your subscription, but you have access to everything. So um, you can listen um, to three and a half, four years of, of content should you choose to. Um, and then the next question, do you take listeners questions and addresses? The answer is we do, we, we do that via email. I think we also still have call in lines where you can actually call in and, and leave a recorded message with your question or send us an audio file. So yeah, those. the beauty of the, um, the podcast is that the platform itself allows for discussion in the sense that users will ask questions amongst the community. They'll ask questions back to the actual editors or they'll ask questions to the experts. And we try to actually get those answers back to you. And there are a lot of questions. There are actually quite a lot of questions that come through. And so we selectively um, uh, answer the top questions. And then uh, we try to get back uh, to you through that discussion forum. So within the actual uh, app itself or the, uh, the web um, uh, platform. However, there is also, a, to Dan's point about the call-in line, we actually do incorporate user questions as well as user topic suggestions. And so at the top and the end of the of the every month episode, we have what's called introduction in the mailbag. And what we do is we actually answer user questions and then address those that actually, um, if there's a lot of vigorous conversation around uh, communication around a particular segment or chapter, then we'll address it if there's further deep dives that we wanna do. Um, and then we also take your top suggestions, but we also like to highlight um, people's voices, but uh, that's only if you want to actually share that too with your voice. So. Uh, we, we incorporate in lots of different ways. Yeah. All right, great. Next question, is LLSA usually used with the video course or can it be uh, a singular purchase? The answer is um, it dovetails with the podcast, um, but you don't need to have the podcast to have the LLSA. The LLSA stands alone. Those clinical questions are complete. Uh, the answer explanations are detailed and you have all the information you need right there. The question is, if, if you want to go further, then you have access to that PubMed article or you have access to the podcast if you have a subscription. And then the last question, which Paul, I'll throw to you is, um, uh, can you talk at some point about the presenter qualifications and backgrounds? Where do they come from and how do you vet them for bootcamp or the podcasts? Yeah, that's such a wonderful question because that is the thing that we're always aware of and we always um, make sure we do a very rigorous job around. I mean, I'll, I'll answer from two different perspectives. One is from a CME perspective and one is from a practical perspective. I'll start with the CME perspective first because I wanna make sure that everyone's aware that this is a CME product. All of our products are. And so from that perspective, we actually have to abide by um, uh, a lot of uh, strict criteria. So making sure that we are aware of bias, right? That we are aware of what the authority and credibility of, of the sources whether they're the actual root, like literature sources, all the way through to the actual presenta presentation, as well as the presenters of that information, and also whatever conflicts of interest um, that exist. So I guess that goes with the bias. And then there's a component of peer review, if you will, to make sure that whatever is actually delivered is to the best of our knowledge, accurate and consistent with the, what we call epistemic consensus of scientific evidence, right? And we all know, I think that there's always an evolving dynamic shift in what the bulk of evidence and how shifting guidelines and perspectives will change. And so there's quite a very rigorous peer review process that actually ends up happening. So there are criteria we have to fulfill from a CME perspective, but then there's a practical perspective of like the actual, um, to, to the point of the, the question, what are the qualifications, if you will, of like these people who are actually presenting this evidence and what authority do they have? And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll start off from a figurative explanation, which is that this is kind of like the tip of an iceberg. What you see at the end product of everything is literally the tip, the final thing that you see. However, there's quite a lot that goes into the actual production of, a, an, a, of any piece that we do. However, I'll specifically focus on the podcast for purposes of time. So to reveal a little bit under the hood, we actually have, like I alluded to earlier, um, a pitch session, if you will, where we actually talk through um, our clinical team. So there's a dedicated clinical team comprised of multiple different professions, as well as the levels of experience. They're all um, either emergency medicine, urgent care, or family medicine who practices urgent care, um, that we actually have regular sessions to, to pitch ideas, 
based on a curriculum that we actually have adjudicated across multiple different areas, including the College of Urgent Care Medicine, Urgent Care Association, as well as existing curricula that have been published in different fellowships and different publications of like what are the most important competency-based uh, curriculum that need to be covered comprehensively. Um, and through these pitch sessions, um, that's where the ideation starts happening. And then we end up saying, okay, well, let's find the expert who actually is going to be the expert for that particular topic. And so the, the reason why it's a little bit hard to say, well, what are the qualifications? We will always start at the highest. And in general, I'll say the vast majority, and you can see for yourself if you log in and into the Reviews and Perspectives podcast, you'll see what their credentials are going to be. And uh, we always make sure, obviously, that they're board certified. They truly are a subject matter expert in what they're actually going to talk about. Um, but then there's the other element where it's like one can be an expert, where they are knowledgeable and competent, but there is a separate issue of practical just listenability, if you will, which is that there are people who have personality and those who don't. And so from there, what we're trying to do, again, is to maximize engagement. If you have a really boring person who's the world's expert, but you never listen to them, that's going to be a problem, as opposed to a person who is still a subject matter expert, but they actually have a personality that you actually be like, hey, you know what? I want to listen to more of what this person has to say. And so from that perspective, that's where the recruitment aspect of like those guest experts start happening. And then from there, there's actually pre-planning phases of where we actually go through what we want to talk about and make sure that there is in that generation pre-interview that there is a, a list of references to make sure that there's accuracy in what we're actually saying and what we're actually going to be discussing. That's all before the interview. Then there's the actual interview. And then after the interview from post-production, there's a quite an extensive peer review process we go through to make sure from the audio itself, we have a content editing process where peer review happens to make sure that all the statistical evidence um, or the concepts that are being discussed is representative of the epistemic consensus, uh, scientific consensus of what's being discussed. Um, and then that's the audio peer review. And then there's actually a written peer review in a more detail coming through fashion to make sure that what is being represented is actually accurate. And so, from, and then even after that, there's a final sign off. So there's, there's actually quite a lot of stages of peer review for any one piece. Um, I'm happy to geek out on more of it because there is quite a lot to talk about, but I'm not sure if that answers the question, but happy to, I, to go yeah, more into it because I, I geek out on it. Yeah, I think you got it. Um, and, and just a reminder, um, we will give everybody three months free of the Urgent Care Rap podcast. You'll get a chance to, to dig in as Paul suggested and kind of see what some of those, we have a couple quick qu more questions, Paul. I know we're almost at time, so we'll try to get through them quickly. One question was, what is the cost? Um, each of these, these um, courses is priced separately. You can see all of that on our website at, at hippoed.com. Um, and also obviously for, for groups of, of either um, for an entire team or for an organization, we, we work with you on um, specialized pricing and discounting. Um, so you'll have my email address and the email we'll send tomorrow with your urgent care rep uh, podcast information. Um, and you're welcome to, to reach out to me directly or I'll reach out to you and we can talk about specific costs for your organization. Um, but the, the standard pricing is on our website at hippoed.com. Last question here. Some of the topics have solutions for more hospital-based care in the ER versus standalone urgent care. Will, will you continue to discuss in episodes about what can happen in different settings? Yeah, you know, it's such a wonderful question. And in answer to your question, yes, we always make sure and we're mindful of um, uh, getting our guests, if you will, from the host perspective to answer questions from the variety of settings in which urgent care is practiced, because there's quite the spectrum of where urgent care is being practiced. And we're also very mindful of the fact that there are very austere environments where there's extreme limitations of resources that are available for diagnostic and management purposes. And it, it's, it's certainly an ongoing conversation. It's a never ending one because we have different levels of experience that the experts have when it comes to the different urgent care practice settings. But to your point, uh, that is something that actually is in the pitch session. The question is um, that we ask internally of ourselves, what we, when we go to the expert, uh, we will ask them like, well, in this environment where we don't have a lot of resources, like what is it that we can do? And if there's substance in conversation and that person, the ex-subject matter expert has uh, uh, confidence and, and comfort in actually uh, describing or answering that question. Yes, the, I mean, it does get included, but we are extremely mindful of that. Yeah, not sure if right. I answered the question, but happy to discuss more offline. I mean, the process is one that um, we are, uh, we're always evolving and, and trying to refine. Thank you, Paul. So we're exactly at time. 
Um, so we'll wrap it up, but we'll thank everybody so much for listening to us. We really genuinely appreciate it. We're excited, as you can tell, Paul's especially excited to talk about all of this. Um, but I also, maybe not quite as enthusiastic as him, but it's real in me. Um, so you're welcome to reach out to me. Uh, we are um, look forward to giving you more information if you need it. And um, thank you so much again for your time. I was going to ask one last question. How do they reach out to you? Um, well, you can email me directly, dan at hippoed.com. That'll make it really easy. But you're going to, everybody who signed up for the webinar will get an email from us tomorrow. It'll have, the details of how to sign up for urgent care wrap for your free three months. And I think it'll have my contact information on it. Yep. So uh, all of that you'll, you'll be receiving, but Dan at hippoed.com just to make it really easy. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Paul.